Good morning, good afternoon, and of course, more importantly, good evening, uh, wherever you're joining us from. Um, thank you for joining us in the second of our workshop series on customary law, tangible and intangible heritage of Russian communities. Uh, this workshop is organized under the auspices of the One Ocean Hub, which is an international program of research for sustainable development, working to promote fair and inclusive decision-making for a healthy ocean, where both the people and the planet flourish. And the aim of the One Ocean Hub is to bring coastal people, researchers, decision makers, and of course, civil society and international organizations together to value and learn from different knowledge and voices. This workshop is looking specifically at perspectives from the Pacific region. And we're very privileged to have with us three speakers who have got extensive experience working in that part of the world and particularly working with the oceans. Uh, first speaker is Liza Winnie. Liza Winnie is a marine scientist by training who graduated with a Bachelor of Science majoring in marine science as well as a postgraduate certificate in diplomacy and international affairs. Ms. Winnie is a United Nations NIPEN Fellow on Oceans Law and Sea Alumni. Uh, she's currently undertaking research on the impacts of colonial history on customary law and contemporary nation, national ocean related laws in the Solomon Islands. So as you can see, she's got extensive knowledge about the topic we are going to be exploring today. And of course, Miss Winnie is from the Solomon Islands and she's worked actively in that area around ocean resources management. And so she is very, very uh, passionate about the notion that indigenous communities and their perspectives and values must be central in achieving effective management of our ocean resources, which is one of the objectives of the One Ocean Hub. Our second speaker is Vatu Molise. Uh, Vatu is formerly the IUCN Project Liaison Officer housed with the Department of Environmental Protection and Conservation in Vanuatu. He has a Bachelor of Arts in Environmental Studies from the University of South Pacific. And he also has over 10 years experience in the environment sector with biodiversity and conservation projects. And since 2014, he's worked as IUCN project liaison officer overseeing the marine program, uh, which was formerly known as uh, Marine and Coastal Biodiversity Island Projects of Pacific. And now it's called the Critical Ecosystem Partnership Funds in Vanuatu. And finally, but not of course the least, we have got Alfred Alfred Tawaki, who is a community-based fishery and natural resource management specialist, and of course an advocate for community-driven approaches to climate smart adaptations, nature-based solutions, and nature management. Uh, he pioneered the concept of locally managed marine areas, LMMA, in Virata, Fiji in the mid-1990s, and later co-founded the Fiji LMMA Network, and that has expanded rapidly over the years. And in 2000, he was involved in the establishment and coordination of regional and international efforts under the LMMA Network, and so he's well connected with many communities, many practitioners, and of course, many civil society organizations. And for the depth of the work he has done in that part of the world, he has been the recipient of numerous prestigious awards, including the UN Equator Initiative Award in 2002, as well as the Worldwide Foundation Duke of Edinburgh Conservation Award in 2015 and a Distinguished Service Award for the Society of Conservation Biology in Oceania. And as you can see, he's a tireless advocate for supporting communities through the region to better manage the land and sea. And so in view of the depth of experience from all our three speakers today, I'm sure you would agree with me that we are in to learn a lot of and 
get a lot from perspectives and rich contributions from all the speakers. And so without further ado, I'm happy to introduce our first speaker, Liza Winnie. Liza, thank you for agreeing to present for us. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm here, caveat, I'm here in a, in a terminal, so um, I hope they don't do, use the intercom very soon. I'll turn off my internet for, I mean, my video for internet purposes. So um, I'm sitting here and I realized that we're, we often think of, of the ocean in different ways. Some of us, the ocean, uh, we think of the ocean as it wrecks havoc through that um, cyclones. Um, we think about tsunamis and there's like for Solomon Islands, man eating saltwater crocodiles. We also think about the systems that govern it as well. I guess for most of he uh, us here today in this panel, um, we view the ocean as an amazing complex system, especially for those of us from village communities um, that are formed near vast oceans of um, ocean spans of water. Our communities have, have thrived for centuries on everything that the ocean had provided and actually built systems to govern it. Um, but this idyllic way of life is under threat with recent developments such as colonialism, independence, global environmental crisis, to name a few. In Solomon Islands, we are 98% ocean and only 2% land. But interestingly, many of our governance systems are designed to address land issues. Uh, these systems were constructed by the colonial administrators. Our national institutions, laws, and power structures were bequitted to us at the departure of the British Imperial administration in the 1970s. We inherited a nationality that is fundamentally foreign and violates the basic ontology of our people. It created a nationality that promotes and facilitates destructive economic activities like logging and mining. That's the um, only revenue um, for our country as well at the moment, including fisheries. It grabs land away from tribes and kin groups. It trivializes people as place and belittles these localities. The status quo is positioned to facilitate recolonizing actors and bringing in structural, structural violence and undermining local traditional leaderships. This nationality overshadows our rich way of life, a traditional system that exists with ancient civilization. I come from New Lenny a traditional village where my mother is from, the Yasi or the ocean is an integral part of our lives. The, the same can be said of many island communities across Solomon Islands. New Lenny is an artificial island built by my grandparents and um, other great grandparents using innovative traditional engineering knowledge and hard coral stones, a practice that still amazes people from the continents. I am of this sea, Ayasi, meaning woman of the sea. I owe that claim from my mother through her lineage from the Yimolayasi or people of the sea. I am also a mother. My children are perfectly entitled to call themselves Welayasi or children of the sea. In such communities, women play a pivotal role. You were to imagine a coastal dwelling or in my case, an artificial island community, you will no doubt recognize the IAS's role in, in ocean management, especially in fisheries. They are gleaners, they're fisherwomen, they're fish sellers, or a policy worker like me. Our role has influenced how we make sense of the world, how we construct who we are as people and place. The, the, the central contention here is simple but critical. In the Pacific, there exists a functioning ancient society in existence across multiple islands far before European contact. The Asti, the ocean, has a huge role in our construction of the world. It was along these ocean currents that we sailed to find home, the same waters that we travel on to trade, to barter, and to discover new islands, but most important to sustain us. It is our highway. In the Asian continent, it is our Silk Road. In the United States, it is our Route 66 or the famed Pacific Highway. 
We had built systems and power structures since time immemorial. Our traditional marine management system still fascinates many today. Our traditional systems have taught us that the land, the Asi, or who we are, is an intimate relationship. This is a crit critical distinction because it then reframes the colonized view that European control was an organizing and unifying influence on Solomon Islands. In fact, it was a disruptive intervention into existing affairs of us as Imolayasi or people of the sea. These disruptive interventions persist in current processes today. In 2018, I led the marine spatial planning process in Solomon Islands. My task was to go around and um, meet high level government decision makers and influence them, get them to want to do marine pla uh, spatial planning. Interestingly, while I was carrying out the consultation with high level government decision makers, I encountered pushback and it took me two years. But one thing struck me from one key decision maker. He was uncomfortable with the notion of dry, drawing lines over the ocean space. He reminded me that whatever system we develop to improve ocean management must recognize the local people's value of the ocean. That made me thought of my grandmother and the Imulayasi. They have developed an advanced spatial zoning of their marine space, not with lines, but planned according to the ecosystems. Coral reefs are protected for special occasions or to barter with neighbors to establish relationships. Less productive areas were allocated for day-to-day -day sustenance and so forth. The management of this entire space was with the priest. Interestingly, they call him devil priest when, when, when um, um, administ uh, Western administrators came in. This reminded me that in order for us to have a plan that works for us, the Himalayas' perspectives are critical in shaping any ocean governance responses, and they must be included throughout public policy making processes. My message today can be summed up in three ways. First, let's reframe ocean governance interventions using our local values. Let's focus on rebuilding systems, both legislative and policy that enhance our ability to be better manage our, our resources. Systems that put prestige on our uniquely unifying influence across the Pacific's multilingual societies. Second, we must learn of these systems that already exist in our communities, like the Malayasi, and ensure that we maintain this equilibrium between people and the sea. We must understand their traditional values and community actors that shape the governance. What did they do? How did they do it? Why did they do it? And finally, as a Pacific Island policymaker, know yourself, who you are. I am Malayasi. And it is only through that self-indulgent analysis can I truly see how I can confidently contribute to dialogues that shape legislations and policies and be grounded on who I am and where I come from. We are all part of an entire nation of islanders sustained by the ocean. We are of the sea. We make up a significant proportion of world's indig indigenous population. We also operate in a very complex system, which is very different to the rest of the world. It is our responsibility to ensure any ocean governance processes is fitting for our people. Tagio Tumas. Thank you, Liza. Thank you very much for that very inspiring opening um, presentation. Yes, uh, we should own where we are from. We are, <laughs> we are of the sea. If we're of the sea, we should own that and we should put that through when we're making decisions about the ocean and management of the resources attached to the ocean. Thank you very much. Um, our next presenter is quickly following up from um, Lisa's presentation, over to Melissa, over to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Bola, and uh, thank you, Oceans Hub, for 
inviting me to come and join uh, in this uh, <clears throat> very interesting seminar. Uh, yes, I'll be presenting uh, my perspective on um, uh, customary law and intang intangible uh, heritage and uh, uh, with regards to, um, yes, those two uh, perspectives, but also as uh, this, this is Ocean Hub, so it's also to do with uh, marine resource management or oceans uh, uh, programs. So I'll be doing a presentation um, mirroring what uh, Lisa has just uh, shared. I think uh, she's uh, put it very beautifully, and I will just try and uh, uh, complement that with the context of uh, what we have here in Vanuatu, which is very similar to Solomon's and Fiji and the rest of the Pacific Islands in, uh, in terms of our uh, customary uh, resource, resource management or traditional resource management. And uh, I think that coming down to the question of uh, bringing these two worlds between the modern and the tradition together. So I'll share my presentation now. You all see it? Yes, we can see it better. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Oh, for some reason, it's not moving. Okay. All right, so uh, I'll briefly be uh, touching upon, um, well, I'll try to go into depth of um, uh, community-based resource management or traditional uh, resource management here in, uh, in Vanuatu. Um, this is a standard presentation that uh, uh, is, is, is done by the Cultural Center uh, while my work with the uh, Department of Environment, uh, our close partners are with the Cultural Center because they are obviously to do with the traditional uh, knowledge and culture um, uh, of Vanuatu as the mandated agency to look after these things. So the, these two agencies combined uh, to try and um, uh, do the work uh, to, do, to do with uh, traditional resource management. And... Uh, uh, community-based resource management, customary law, and uh, how communities uh, in, in Vanuatu manage their resources. So similar to all the other Pacific Islands, like uh, Lisa said, uh, our countries, our uh, archipelago, our people have a rich culture and a history over thousands of years. So for example, in Vanuatu, we have over 100 different cultural and linguistic groups. Uh, you might find that in Vanuatu, it's the highest uh, per capita, actually, language uh, per capita. Uh, so we have a wide range of uh, TRM uh, customs uh, locally throughout the archipelago from north to south, based on traditional uh, environmental knowledge. Uh, over the thousands of years, um, our indigenous people and our ancestors have recognized uh, uh, the cycles of uh, how the uh, environment works from the uh, from the oceans to the to the to the bush to the mountains and uh, so they understood the way of uh, things how they how uh, living things operated on our islands they were natural scientists and uh, did uh, observation and uh, research and they called it custom they developed it into a, a system that, that molded our society and our lives. So uh, we, uh, we, the custom, it becomes uh, integral or integrated as part of ourselves as indigenous uh, uh, Nivanuatu, 
people, we are closely connected with our environment and our land. So uh, the two are almost uh, inseparable. Um, <clears throat> so this has been uh, recognized uh, over the many years, as uh, Lisa has put it. Uh, Vanuatu as well as the other Pacific Islands have been uh, former colonies and uh, subjected to colonization. And we have been uh, um, uh, imposed or adopted this, uh, uh, this Western model of, uh, of this modern state that we have. And, um, uh, but we also have, before this uh, modern state came upon us over 200 years ago, uh, Europeans, uh, Captain Cook, we had our traditional and uh, cultural custom governance systems. And um, uh, the issue nowadays, uh, we gained our independence in, in 1980 and adopted this, this system as uh, we became a republic and a country and part of the, uh, the global world. And um, uh, the issue since 1980, 40 years on, has always been trying to find that uh, balance between the traditional old custom uh, base and foundation and this new modern system that we have. Um, and uh, trying to find the balance between the two, one's more of a top-down approach while the other's more bottom-up. And so uh, uh, usually the two don't uh, interlink or mesh together well. Um, uh, because it's uh, with the Western system, it's more of a centralized system, whereas uh, the traditional systems that we have in governance authorities, it's a decentralized uh, system. So uh, the, with a centralized system, as is the case for most parts of the world, developed uh, developing countries, governments don't have enough resource, time, manage, uh, money or uh, human resource to do all these things. And uh, usually these services uh, are lacking. And given our geography in our archipelagos, 83 islands spread across this ocean, it's uh, usually uh, also compounded and a dilemma for us. But uh, uh, trying to recognize the traditional resource management or customary marine tenure, CMT, uh, that, all, that is already operating and trying to uh, uh, empower it, empower it more in this modern system is the best way I think that uh, we should uh, try to amalgamate these two models together and find a, a perfect fit for all of us. So um, uh, yes, when you talk about uh, marine, uh, customary marine tenorship, traditional resource management. Uh, these, these systems have been operating within our, on our shores, in our islands for eons. Our ancestors have been uh, fishing uh, in the reefs and uh, putting taboos or blocks and knowing which places to, what times to open, what times of the season of the year to, to, um, to harvest uh, certain marine resources uh, traditional ways of uh, of uh, of trapping and uh, size limits, um, nets, uh, gear restrictions. Uh, these have been practiced for for forever. So um, it's just a matter of uh, 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 trying to recognize these uh, these systems formally. In the modern in the modern state, and with the common laws that we have, and uh, uh, bringing these two aspects together um, is the best way uh, forward uh, to try and uh, address this uh, this issue. Uh, so, as I mentioned, uh, all these all these uh, different um, types of uh, management, marine management. Uh, uh, exist already uh, for thousands of years by our ancestors, and it's all ingrained in our cultural uh, 
uh, societies and our traditions. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a living, uh, it's a living uh, form of management and uh, custom uh, for it to remain in, uh, or operate in its most uh, uh, best uh, form. It should be flow, uh, fluid and flexible um, uh, and not restricted. Whereas the common law and uh, Western uh, models, it's uh, black and white written down on paper, whereas our traditions are all uh, oral. So it's very fluid and flexible, but uh, uh, nevertheless, we we uh, we live in these modern times with these uh, with common laws that we have that make up our state, and uh, we have to find a way in which to in which to um, recognize these laws. And so, in um, in the wisdom of our forefathers of independence in 1980, they saw that this was the basic foundations of. Uh, what uh, Vanuatu as a state should uh, should uh, should develop and uh, continue as so they enshrined it enshrined this in our constitution. I think it's in chapter twelve, article seventy three or seventy two, in which they clearly state that all land in the Republic of Vanuatu belongs to the indigenous custom owners and descendants, and also the rules of custom shall form the basis of the ownership and use of land in the. Republic of uh, Vanuatu and uh, land includes reefs following the local custom and customary law shall have uh, shall continue to have effect. So this part was uh, this was a fundamental and most important uh, aspect. One of the reasons why we fought for and struggled for our independence and our founding fathers uh, sought into the wisdom that they shall enshrine this in our constitution. So in in the in the constitution, this this is uh, this is captured, and so it's it's preserved in there. Now, trying to um, go a level down from the constitution into the into the uh, the various legislations pertaining to uh, traditional resource management or marine resource management is where the issues uh, come about. Because as I mentioned, the customary custom is uh, how it operates is to be fluid and flexible. But once you uh, limit it or um, write it down, then you, you restrict it. So no longer does the ultimate authority lie with the customary governance authorities, but now it can be reverted and taken away to court, the court of law. So uh, that's, uh, um, that's the issue that we have trying to develop our current uh, range of laws um, uh, to to fit this uh, the traditional and, the, and this uh, modern context. Um, so there's a number of ways to go about it in which you try and uh, you try and um, do this. It's already been protected in the constitution under that under those chapters and articles. But uh, it seems that maybe trying to revive these as uh, when the colonial system and the powers uh, came in, as with colonization, they disrupted a lot of these uh, uh, customary governance systems, obviously to gain access to the lands and the resources. And so some of these things were degraded. Uh, so. At the, at, at the current stage in uh, modern times, it's not that the, obviously it's not at the similar st status it, it once was before prior to colonization, but, um, um, uh, and to go back to that state would be, uh, would be uh, quite, a, quite a task. But uh, thankfully, uh, these systems survived and, uh, are trying to be currently revived to the uh, customary governance systems, the chiefs uh, that we have here in Vanuatu. They're trying to revive these, and these are some of the uh, different types of uh, mechanisms that uh, traditionally are used. If they are enforced and, uh, um, and uh, managed, these governance authorities with the chiefs, their respect is still maintained, and these uh, mechanisms are functional and operational. Then you'd see that uh, uh, 
these systems will work. The resources will come back. How you manage them and uh, keep them uh, will will uh, continue and be effective. But uh, where these systems are degraded or have been lost, then you get the issues because uh, 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 people start uh, over exploiting uh, resources and um, uh, and uh, not respecting these traditions and norms and and therefore uh, exploiting the resources to a state that uh, uh, is not sustainable and um, uh, detrimental actually to the environment and the health of the, the people as well. Um, so these are just examples of how we put taboos in Vanuatu. When, whenever these are cycad uh, palm leaves, uh, whenever this, uh, this is a chief in the in Gao and Northern Banks Islands of Vanuatu, when uh, it's uh, they want to uh, block off a, a, a reef, put a taboo, they they put this uh, this uh, this palm, which is a very important uh, uh, item in our custom, and everyone re recognizes it, and nobody um, uh, goes in and trespasses to towards the resources. There's, there's different versions and different, all the different uh, types of um, uh, vegetation, plants, they all have specific and uh, uh, meanings and uh, uses uh, in this regard for uh, uh, resource management. And so uh, these all exist, but uh, again, as I've explained that uh, the amalgamating of the two and recognizing um, one um, or making them both come into balance is the is the issue. <clears throat> so since then, um, a number of uh, initiatives have been carried out in, in terms of trying to do this. Uh, they've introduced taboos uh, for commercial resources. Uh, but then uh, these weren't respected because you've got issues of uh, land disputes and chiefly titles. Uh, other possible ways to uh, do away the, with the land disputes, which are the most common uh, problems, is to try and use the co cooperative management or uh, tourism, eco-cultural tourism, so that everyone gets the benefits. They respect the taboos that are put in place. And uh, in that way, custom is ongoing, but uh, uh, you, uh, communities get that uh, alternative uh, support measure, livelihood that they can uh, get uh, benefit from uh, when with given uh, restrictions to the uh, to the resource. Obviously, also giving um, increasing population, uh, etc. Another one that we we. Uh, one law that tries to do this, that is the only one that we have currently in Vanuatu, is the under the EPC Act, the Environment Protection Conservation Act of 2013, in which um, our uh, protected areas, so they call it community conservation areas, which tries to amalgamate the two of the traditional resource management um, approach and also this Western protected areas. Uh, approach, but uh, so you get in the CCAs, the management plan is created uh, by the community in which the rules and fines and penalties are, are come up with, which are usually just the normal trouble and uh, penalties, rules and fines and penalties that are applied. But this is just put in the management plan in black and white, and, and uh, a CCA management committee is uh, drawn up to try and um, to oversee and manage this uh, management plan, which is made up of the community members. So, in that way, which trying to empower the custom and the traditional management that uh, that is already in the community. So this has uh, uh, this has operated since 2013. So far, we have about 10 registered uh, community conservation areas. Uh, but there's also been pushback, as I've uh, as been already mentioned, alluded to by Lisa and his, uh, as well, uh, with the with the fact that uh, this this uh, there's this uh, conflict between uh, drawing lines and keeping custom fluid and flexible. Uh, so uh, obviously drawing the lines is with the Western approach of protected areas, which they also take towards um, land registration and leases, titles. Uh, so um, uh, that's, that's also 
uh, the issue. So there's a number of ways that we are trying to go about this. CCAs are one way that's trying to uh, accomplish this, but uh, uh, there's, a, there's a number of other uh, legislations that look into this, um, but still need, still need to be um, uh, explored uh, as uh, opportunities or ways that, uh, ways that we, can, uh, we can use the common law legislation to uh, uh, understand uh, uh, or to, to empower and recognize customary uh, law on the same uh, or on par with uh, common law. Um, so I yes, I'm not I'm not sure how I'm doing with time, but I'm just going to uh, quickly go through um, all these uh, next few slides, and just to um, uh, highlight and uh, and stress that uh, uh, customary law or traditional resource management. Uh, uh, should be should be uh, empowered and uh, 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 giving the given the formal recognition or allowed to operate at a level or on par with uh, common law uh, or the legislations that have uh, because uh, if if the if the traditional resource management and the customary laws uh, operate uh, at a, at a level that's uh, uh, that is uh, respected by all the communities, then you'll see that uh, all, all the management of resource, how you use the land and the sea are done sustainably. So uh, um, this has to be, this, has, this is a key issue to, to be addressed and uh, uh, specific, uh, specifically with uh, uh, development plans and aspirations of the nation. We have a People's Plan 2030 Sustainable Development Plan. This I see is a critical uh, key component uh, to be to be accomplished and uh, and uh, and and yeah achieved so that the plan can be achieved by 2030 and so that the state of Vanuatu I think uh, can can uh, can progress. Uh, as this uh, last slide states, if communities can't manage their resources, nobody can. So, um, yes, I think it's it's that that's it's that uh, that model that model state that uh, we've uh, we adopted from the Western uh, uh, context and the traditional uh, uh, state that existed. How we amalgamate the two and find this perfect balance is where we, I think, uh, would be uh, uh, the best, the best uh, way for, the, for our country, as well as maybe uh, others in the Pacific or even the world to, to go, go, uh, go ahead. So I think I'll stop here. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, for that very detailed presentation. Uh, I actually do have a few questions arising from that, but I will leave it to the end of the whole presentation. And um, our third presenter for today um, is Alfredi. Uh, Alfredi, I, I hope your connection is a bit better now. Excellent, yes. So I'll leave you in his capable hands. Hello, uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Can you hear me? Hi, Alfred, we can hear you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the, the presentation. I'm, uh, I'm connecting from uh, Palau in uh, North uh, Pacific and uh, the internet is not as, uh, as uh, strong. So I'll try to be very brief um, just to be able to uh, uh, stick within the, the time frame, uh, hopefully, that I can still connect. Um, I 
the title the, of uh, the what I wanted to share is uh, looking at uh, the critical roles of uh, customary law and tenure system in uh, uh, in implementation of uh, what is called locally managed marine areas. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm looking more at the application of uh, of um, you know the uh, LMMAs in the in the areas where you know customary law and tenure system um, uh, you know exists and. Uh, and uh, that's also where the, the interface of uh, traditional uh, management systems and uh, emerging or Western science are, uh, are applied or married uh, to some extent. So I'm, uh, I'm not going to go through the, the legal aspect, but I'll pick up the, uh, the application of uh, customary law in the, in the Fiji context uh, along the way. Um, So I, I'd like to go back to the customary law. My apologies, I, I didn't um, have the uh, chance to uh, connect with the other colleagues, but uh, the customary law definition, uh, which is very uh, basic um, and right from uh, Google, customary law in its simplest form is a, a body of rules, unofficial and generally unwritten, established through cultural or societal norms um, and I think that's a, uh, there's a good uh, background for those uh, of us who are non-legal uh, have uh, you know background to to see where uh, customary law and its application in um, resource management, and in particular, the locally managed marine area implementation in this case. Um, a bit of a, a, a background uh, about uh, uh, Fiji, that uh, at least 80% of the land uh, and the coastal areas um, are community owned. Um, and uh, you know, that goes back uh, in time and perhaps is also one of the, the very few countries in the Pacific or in the world that have, uh, a cut, that have their fishing grounds demarcated uh, or delineated. Um, and uh, we'll go through that. Uh, and uh, in this case, uh, yeah, those, those uh, uh, land and sea uh, tenor systems are recognized in uh, in common law, uh, even though the there is also a a delineation of where customary law ends, um, and that's where common law uh, uh, starts. Uh, but uh, in uh, resource management and nowadays uh, there seems to be uh, the blurry of that um, of, the, of the lines eh? and uh, and there's an intentional uh, approach to try and uh, and marry uh, traditional management systems and uh, resource management uh, uh, modern resource management uh, uh, regimes or measures uh, my, I, I like to go back into uh, and 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 share a little bit about myself. Uh, you know, my my totem tree is the the Vesi or Instesia bijuga. The my totem fish is the snapper fish, uh, and that means uh, a lot more to us than just the tree and the fish. Uh, for my clan we have the moral obligation to protect these two uh, species. Uh, you know, this is one of the examples that, uh, that customary law or yes, uh, 
you know, as communities, as um, as uh, clans, uh, with our with our environment and our surroundings, and uh, uh, and and it um, it emphasizes the deep rooted relationship and connections that we have uh, to nature uh, already, um, and and. Uh, and, and those are the things that uh, common uh, that uh, customary law and uh, tenure system that we have in uh, in the Pacific um, are very important uh, as the basis for uh, for resource management. Uh, but we should not overlook uh, these uh, kind of uh, relationships. Uh, it's also. You know, it, it is also uh, symbolic um, in a way that it uh, that is um, uh, that brings the the mana in our traditional governance and and management systems and our connections to the sea. Uh, in the Fiji, in the case of Fiji, the chiefly system, when the chiefs are, are installed, uh, you know, there are. Uh, practices that uh, that is accorded with the uh, with the tradition, and also when the chief uh, passed away, uh, there is um, a res respect shown uh, for the chief's passing by putting a hundred days uh, ban as a sign of mourning. Uh, and when in the in the chief in installation of the chief, uh, that is also uh, you know accorded, eh? and the. You know what comes out, or the impact, or the what comes out in the, uh, is the uh, at the end of the hundred days, the catch uh, or the three years is is often a, a measure of the mana uh, that the chiefs has or the clan leaders has uh, and their connection to the to the sea. Um, and there is also the traditional, the traditional um, uh, knowledge uh, that uh, we have. These are place-based, and I think we, everyone in the room is uh, uh, well aware of that. Uh, you have to be, uh, you have we we have to practice this knowledge to continue to be. Uh, uh, to keep it alive, uh, we can we can have the knowledge, but if we uh, are not practicing it, um, uh, it may not mean uh, uh, as much uh, as they were uh, in the in the days. Eh? And in here, just uh, showing here some of the. Uh, this is a village where they are using the the coconut leaves uh, as a as a blind to guide the stranded whales out of the shallow waters uh, back into the uh, and and these were some of the things that their ancestors have uh, have have done they've seen uh, and uh, they're able to uh, do that immediately and all these are embodied in in what I uh, call as a, and what I define earlier on as the customary law or and and the tenure system. Eh? Uh, so these are the the relationships that I mentioned uh, earlier that I explained above are foundation to what uh, LMMA or locally managed marine area uh, uh, does promote and uh, think that are core to the implementation and the resource management uh, in in the Pacific. Um, and uh, for those that are not familiar, LMMA or locally managed marine area is a is a, in a marine area that is under some form of community management or uh, or collaborative management. Um, and that's the um, the current uh, definition of recognizing that uh, yes, there is a traditional uh, 
management, as long as communities are involved, uh, there's also uh, the, the need to look at uh, uh, collaborative management uh, much more intentionally as well. Uh, the terms that are used across the, the Pacific are also listed, you know, Ra'ui for uh, Cook Islands, uh, Sasizen, uh, Kapu for Hawaii, and there's a, and this, you can see that, you know, they, they resonates across the, the, the Pacific and the Oceania in general. So, yes, uh, locally managed uh, marine areas is founded or, uh, in fact, uh, um, works best uh, in areas where customary law uh, uh, exists or customary practices exist and obtain a system because uh, it can uh, enhance you know, the, the values that uh, communities, the traditional governance that will help uh, keep uh, promoting the, you know, this uh, traditional management uh, practices. Uh, LMMA, the approach uses more of uh, adaptive learning. Uh, this is where the, the marrying of the, 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 the practices and the uh, modern approach uh, comes in um, while the while the the rules while the rules uh, the origin of the rules uh, comes from uh, you know have uh, historically been used but they are beginning to uh, write down uh, for effective uh, management and uh, effective uh, enforcement uh, as well uh, the key stakeholders uh, still for for us are uh, looking at uh, the customary uh, fishing rights owners. They are the key to the implementation of uh, uh, locally managed, and these are the basis as well of the customary law. The unit of uh, of ownership, uh, where knowledge uh, is um, you know is based, and where people. Um, who are the resident, who are holders of the knowledge are, are registered into it. Um, yes, community empowerment has uh, now become uh, far more um, uh, important in uh, including and, and looking at a very uh, socially inclusive approach, uh, looking at the, uh, our mothers and the, the, the youths uh, but our mothers are also the, the source of uh, uh, traditional knowledge, uh, local knowledge and, and practices that uh, uh, that needs to be uh, brought out more uh, to be able to uh, share uh, uh, for for you know consensus and decision making. Yeah, my my the rest of my slides are just uh, pictures and photos to <laughs> and I'll talk through those um, and I'll go through very very quickly from here um, you know for for uh, having a good uh, resource management uh, strategy requires a lot of uh, 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 dialogue uh, Talanoa and uh, providing that space for the elders uh, to sit down and talk amongst themselves and amongst the community to share is, uh, is quite critical. And, and that's where they are uh, beginning to see the give and take this clan. Okay, this is our, uh, this is our, um, our knowledge, our wisdom uh, for the collective good of the of the community and uh, the new uh, the modern strategy is uh, looking at uh, um, teaching them to monitor um, uh, their resources uh, their tambu areas and see whether it's uh, it's effective or not 
analyzing them, uh, presenting the results, and then socializing them uh, as well. The, these are some of the, the tools that uh, uh, locally managed uh, marine areas uh, uses across the Pacific and, um, and Fiji. I'll, I'll, I can I can also uh, recognize that some of these have been mentioned by our uh, previous speakers, uh, and these are based on um, on uh, traditional knowledge. Um, and the, while they are written, but they are still not uh, legally uh, uh, legal can still not legally enforced. Uh, and the the various tools that are um, that are there can be employed directly by the community, uh, by the endorsed by the chief. Uh, and implemented and enforced by the, the chief as long as they are as long as they are, if there is no um, there's, um, there's no challenge from outside the community within the community they can manage these rules within the, the, the boundaries of their their marine tenure or their fishing ground and their, their land tenure systems uh, as well. Eh? And permanent closes, these are, are usually based on, uh, you know, spawning areas or areas where they are, uh, you know, the communities have identified um, and, uh, you know, those species restrictions, gear restrictions and uh, like in, in the, the work that LMA does, uh, you know, uh, tries to bring more uh, of the community's uh, input and knowledge and the practices to the front uh, first and foremost before uh, allowing for the common law to be uh, you know to take effect uh, if they can work within the, the boundaries and the rules of their community uh, that's the the perfect uh, system and in, uh, where they have to enforce for for people from outside, uh, and that's where they need uh, the common uh, uh, law or legislations to help uh, and help them enforce. I'll go through to the to the end and just to share that. Um, uh, the, the work that I've uh, uh, explained uh, here that uh, is going on in Fiji through the Fiji Locally Managed Marine Area through the LMMA movement uh, across the Pacific uh, have uh, gained traction in Fiji. So, and uh, a lot of the communities are working on uh, um, on those, even though not perfect. But uh, they're using it as a starting point. So so far, around seventy-one percent, sorry, seventy percent, seventy-nine percent of the fishing ground, customary fishing grounds, are under some form of management. Um, so far, and uh, and that uh, covers around seventy-one percent of the coastal villages, around four hundred and seventy, uh, and which is part of our. Uh, target for the next five years, uh, three years uh, left by 2025 uh, to have a, what we call 100% solution to have 100% coverage uh, for all the fishing grounds, the customary fishing grounds where all the communities uh, become part of the movement contributing both to their livelihoods and their survivals, but more importantly, uh, but also to contributing to national uh, targets uh, as well. In um, in summary, uh, we we feel that the process that uh, we've used that LMA uses uh, ensures um, or tries to ensure that FPIC, uh free, prior, and informed consent uh, are always uh, at the forefront. Uh, be the 
guidance of how we approach communities and co communities, um, how we work and engage with communities and we take more of a rights-based approach to that, which is also aligned to the um, SDG 14. Uh, community empowerment is, uh, is critical as we see knowledge holders, the elders uh, are there, uh, but the younger generation says, um, you know, there's a, a, a real need for, for the younger generation. There's a, a need for intergenerational um, awareness, or intergenerational uh, learning or intentional mentoring. Uh, where this uh, critical body of knowledge, traditional knowledge and practices can be passed down uh, uh, to willing, willing youths uh, uh, for, you know, for the, the future of uh, uh, resource management and the survival of our, our clans as well in the, in the future. Uh, with that, I will uh, leave that uh, 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 this evening and uh, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to share a little bit about uh, uh, customary law and its application and uh, to LMMA's uh, implementation in the in the Pacific and in particular Fiji. Nak. Excellent. Thank you very much, Ala Ferretti, and thank you to Lisa Fatu and Ala Ferretti for the three fantastic and insightful presentations. I can see we've already got some questions in the chat, so I'm going to pass over to Mia, who will be managing the Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much to all the amazing speakers um, for extremely interesting and insightful presentations. Um, and I, for one, have learned so much. Um, we already have quite a few questions. I'm just going to start. Um, one question is from SI um, asking to all the presenters, um, what are the views of cultural knowledge being a barrier and sometimes in specific cases alienates non-land resources owners or settlers to use or benefit the ocean space or its resources? or cultural context or keeping power within own tribes and families, etc. So I don't know if any of the specific um, speakers would want to respond to that. Sorry, can you repeat that question again? Of course, Lisa. So what are the views of cultural knowledge being a barrier and sometimes in specific cases alienating non-land resource owners or settlers to benefit the ocean space or its resources? So looking at could it be a barrier and um, that it being sometimes used against um, non-land resource owners or settlers? Um, so the following of the question is also whether it's a cultural context or keeping power within own tribes. So are there any ways that, um, yes, it could be a barrier um, from your point of view? Um, I, can, I can give an answer and the others can add in. Yeah. All right. Um, yeah, well, uh, for that question, I see it. Yet it's a uh, it's a big issue for uh, for us here in Vanuatu, especially. I, I guess it would be for others as well. Um, the question of uh, uh, for us, it would be customary landowners versus uh, what what do you call it? Um, incomers, settlers, uh, foreigners, and uh, the issue of development because it's all tied with uh, the land and land tenureship. And unless the custom landowners uh, agree, the development can't take place. So this can be an issue, or it is a major issue actually. So, such an issue, in fact, that uh, for us, the laws here had to be changed in 2013, our current uh, land laws, because uh, the prior laws 
we had the we had a, a great issue of uh, a land land boom, land sales. So people were selling the the lands on lease, uh, left, right, and center. And uh, uh, this became an issue because uh, all the land was being sold off. So uh, this is an issue in this regard, but it's it's trying to find that balance uh, from my perspective. Uh, what developments do you want to have happening in your on your land, in your on your land area, your coast? And uh, this development, as long as it benefits everyone and uh, appropriate uh, uh, landowners and uh, communities, uh, and all the the rightful ones are respected. And it also comes down to the issue of uh, uh, finding out who the who the correct landowner is, which is also a um, a legacy from the colonization from our colony colonial period, I, I think as well with uh, with that issue. So yes, I saw another comment coming in from, and I think the colonization. Uh, these are all the uh, systemic or stemming issues from that that point of view, but. Looking forward, it's a way trying to find that balance. So the right development coming in and agreeing with all the land community landowners. And uh, I think that's the best way to go forward from my point of view. Thanks. Um, thank you, Vatu. If I can um, chime in as well. Um, for me, in my perspective, I think that process is critical. Um, and there's a nuance as well within processes. So in the traditional or the ancient days, there is a way of how people come to live together, whether they be the ones with power or the ones that have the right to use. Um, there's a process to do that. Now, over time with recent developments, that process had been ignored. Um, and so we have cases in Solomon Islands now where um, we're doing large scale government developments where um, we're researching back processes of, a, of, of certain localities. How do they, how do they come together and, and, and can equally participate? Um, and, and you bring back those, those values that they have. The values, the ancient values is about for the common good to ensure that, that once this person comes into our fold, they're part of us. They, they should be able to access and, and, and uh, participate in, in whatever resources that we have. But that over time had been um, disrupted because of um, the ways or the processes that we had used to date. So I think that is one thing that we should also consider when we're engaging with our local um, communities, that the processes we use are, are, should be fitting. Thank you. So if I, if I may just, uh, just add uh, that uh, I think it's important to, to note also that not all traditional practices uh, are for common good, um, and uh, it it goes back to the purpose. Uh, the example that uh, comes to mind is, uh, uh, you know, many many Fijian communities uh, think or consider poison fishing using the the root, uh, the nduba or rotino as a traditional uh, uh, type of fishing. Maybe in, in, in the olden days, it was okay because there were only fewer of them and it's a way of uh, uh, ensuring efficient uh, method of, uh, of fishing. Uh, nowadays, that is clearly not uh, you know, sustainable. And uh, so I just, um, maybe just put um, uh, a caution here that uh, yes, you know that not all uh, traditional practices, um, you know, uh, can be applied uh, nowadays, and it has to go back to the purpose uh, of why they were there and and its application to to what we need uh, nowadays. Eh? Uh, in the case that was, uh, what was asked is um, in the ocean space, eh? uh, how, how useful or not are those uh, in the ocean space? Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Um, I have one question from Tuba Ali Ferretti. Uh, when considering customary law, how much folklore myths becomes part of those traditional practices? Yes, uh, those are very much, uh, em, you know, embodied in the there's uh, the customary law and uh, and they are. Um, I said they um they are place uh, based, but also uh, you know really dependent on the the holders. Eh? Uh, you know some of the some of the elders. Uh, they can quickly connect their stories and uh, to uh, you know traditional knowledge, uh, traditional practices uh, that we are practicing now or trying to revive. Um, whereas you know the other communities won't be able to do that very very quickly, even though you know those stories and connections are there. And you can see that even within a community, same communities within the same clan, uh, the only uh, a few that I are able to, they still have those uh, those uh, knowledge and the connections, uh, whereas the others only see the practice uh, and are yet to make that connection to the to the folklore and all this, also the the myths. And and I think it's uh, fair to say as well. You know, nowadays, religion is playing a part in uh, how we rule in and rule out some of those uh, myths and uh, folklore uh, uh, as well. Thank you so much, Ali Ferretti, for that, um, which is very insightful. And yeah, um, Alana, if you want to do a question uh, directly, that would be great. Uh, yeah, awesome. I just want to um, commend all the presenters. I think that they were uh, awesome presentations. I wanted to comment also on the last, um, there was a query in relation to the myths and legends. So I go by the name of Fia Fia and I'm from Niue and we conduct um, marine mammal research, but also uh, Niue introduced whale watching and swimming with whales. Now whales, um, this is quite important for us because um, it's quite competitive because you've got the tourism that our industry wants to build. And yet in, um, in our culture, our people highly respect and reverend actually marine mammals. So there was a compromise there in relation to building tourism. So Niue is only one of six countries in the world where you get to swim with marine mammals, but nobody conducts um, except for our NGO, um, the cultural affiliation that our people have with whales. And the reason it's important for us is because we have to instill the reason why for the stewardship and why um, the calves in particular are especially protected because you will have a lot of tourists that come to our island and want to interact and say why is Niue so strict when in actual fact the people have actually allowed you to swim with the whales because tourism uh, we want to generate um, tourism dollars for our country but that is the compromise so we try to instill this and it's a really good question to incorporate because there is a huge loss of um, local and traditional knowledge and also the reverend um, as uh, the speakers alluded to the intangible spiritual connection which is what is not currently accounted for in the blue economy when you're looking at that so thanks for that question I also asked a question earlier um, but they can answer in their own time. And I have reached out as well. If I can get your contacts, this would be great. Um, thank you to the speakers. Thank you, Alana. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to consider that or kind of reflect further on Alana's points in terms of spiritual connections um, in the blue economy and in the kind of national development plans more um, globally. Uh, yeah, yeah I'll, I'll contribute a bit. Yeah. Uh, if I may, yeah. Um, yeah, so as, uh, yes, uh, uh, the comment raised from uh, Anue, 
suggested yes um, as uh, considering management of the ocean space as opposed to terrestrial land space in which uh, our communities you know we live on the land so it's it's more connect the closeness of connectivity is much more than the ocean in that regard and so uh, when it comes to managing the ocean space talking about up to 200 nautical mile EEZ, um, how much does uh, uh, traditions and cultural myths play into that part? Well, just from um, my perspective, uh, from Vanuatu doing our marine spatial planning, uh, we found out that uh, uh, to this regard, well, a constitution already re recognizes custom. So, our, our, our land laws, which is the Customary Land Management Act, uh, it states and it was uh, taken actually to, to court uh, in a case in 2013, I think, Sope, I think it was, uh, they disputed over an area of reef. And so the uh, outcome from that case stated that the law, which defines that uh, custom is out of the reef boundary, or to where custom defines it. So in that sense, uh, if it's uh, like for uh, island of Vanuatu island perspective, to where as far as my eye can see, this is the, the claim of my custom customary rights to it. So, uh, but the issue is doesn't become ownership, but it then becomes management because obviously uh, most communities only only can manage up to the reef's edge or as far as they can dive. Well, the further out they go, that's beyond their capability and out of their hands. So what the message we said was that, okay, from um, the reef's edge up to about 100, uh, 200 meter buffer zone, that's under the community management. But onwards up to that, uh, leave it up to the government to, to manage because obviously the government can, has the capability with its international partners and agencies that they can look into that uh, to that area. So that's that's uh, an input I can give to that that uh, question on the case of uh, cultures, uh, myths, and customary um, yeah uh, links uh, to that regard in management of the ocean space. Thanks. Thank you, Vartu. Uh, Ali Ferretti, did you want to respond to that as well? Yes, um, just to uh, see some of the uh, Alana's uh, uh, questions as well as around the willingness of the, the, the chiefs uh, in, uh, in, in complying with the, with the rules. And, uh, and I think it will be fair to say to that nowadays, uh, uh, in the case of Fiji, it's not totally uh, uh, rules uh, enforcement, and there's a way, uh, and that's where the overlap between the common law and the customary law. Uh, some of the rules, uh, especially in the LMMA communities, are developed by the communities and the chief's endorsements are there and they become, uh, uh, what shall I say, uh, they are part of the gazetteal system for the licensing. Uh, and, and that's where the, the that's where the, the official enforcement uh, or the, the, the legal recognition uh, begins, eh? the legal recognition of community designed uh, rules uh, or customary uh, rules, eh? and they are enforced in the uh, uh, legal way. Um, you know, some of the examples that uh, um, I, can, I, I can share, you know, some of the, you know, the tambus are designed and uh, delineated by the chiefs and the communities or all the rules and when uh, uh, our fishing permits are given they are given with those rules customary rules uh, as exemptions 
to those that want to apply for fishing uh, permits eh? or fishing license. And when it gets to the fisheries department, those exemptions, which are basically customary traditional rules, uh, have, have then become, um, you know, uh, uh, legalized and legally enforced uh, uh, that way. Uh, so, yes, it's a it's a space where it's, I, I can say it's not totally one or the other, uh, not a co a customary law, uh, but I think the, pro probably the future will have to start looking at, uh, at uh, how these two uh, can work um, in tandem with each other. Uh, customary law, uh, but with a, uh, enforcement or compliance uh, in the uh, you know in the common law on, on the legal uh, legal system. Eh? I hope I'm making sense. Uh, otherwise, I can uh, I can reach out to you uh, directly for more of uh, of those uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Charlie Ferretti. Um, so I have two questions that um, kind of overlap or are very centralized around the same thing, and it's for everyone. So if disputes arise around the management of ocean resources, how are they resolved? Um, specifically from Tuba, how are land ownership related disputes resolved if the government system is decentralized? And is it between chief and the people? Um, do the common law courts take responsibility? How um, does it work when it comes to disputes around management of ocean resources? Maybe Lisa, I don't know if you want to, um, if you have a response to this. Sorry, me. I think Lisa might have dropped out because oh, of the no. uh, internet issues. Okay. Um, well, if Watu or Alifretti want to respond, then that'd be great. Oh, okay. I'll uh, I'll give a response, and uh, yeah, Alifretti or others can. So for um, uh, for land disputes, uh, well, for in in Vanuatu's case, um. Yes, land disputes uh, uh, arise often, and the the many. Uh, we have we have uh, traditional courts. Uh, uh, we we call it a nakamal, uh, uh, which is presided over by a chief who works as the uh, educator uh, between the two parties. Uh, so land disputes are taken to in a, in the in the local context in the local level this is where these these are sorted out uh, obviously uh, this can be taken uh, up a notch or to the next level which is actually taking it to the uh, to the courts and that's covered under the uh, the customary land management act and uh, i think it's the land reform act uh in which uh, uh, land disputes are formally uh, formal land disputes are registered and taken to and taken to 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 a court to settle but um uh this has been a big issue as i mentioned in, my, in the previous presentation so much so that the land laws here in vanuatu had to be changed in 2013 that essentially made the process uh, so difficult that no land was being able to be uh, sold off. And so for that purpose, it served its purpose to stop the land boom, land sales that was uh, going on, but it made the system of the process of uh, dealing with these cases of land disputes that brings all the way back to the uh, 1980 independence times to try and, uh, and sort out. So that's a big issue for us here in Vanuatu, trying to sort this, uh, these land issues out. And it stems down to the to the to the, uh, the customary uh, authorities, governance authorities that exist, the chiefs, and uh, um, uh, 
the, the systems that they have and uh, are working, are functioning and are being respected. Uh, so if the Nakamal, the chiefs at the Nakamal uh, um, are respected and these land disputes are settled at that, that level and all the parties land, uh, uh, the different parties claimants are uh, resolved at that level and then uh, what what ideally what the, the current land uh, management act and the land reform act should be should be functioning as is just a tool that uh, these these uh, these issues that are settled at the customary uh, local level traditional level uh, can then be utilized uh, if if the communities, the claimants, the parties want to use their land uh, for to get it registered as a lease, uh, uh, to 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 bring some sort of development onto their onto their land. So I think uh, uh, it's a big issue for us here in Vanuatu, and one we're trying to resolve with the modern laws that we have for our land at the moment. So that's currently uh, consultations to try and amend these laws, actually. But uh, um, our government's actually going to snap elections now, so uh, these, these, it's, it's a long time issue, uh, but uh, one that uh, we still haven't been able to resolve. That's so, yeah, an input I can give from my perspective. Thanks. Thank you, um, Ali Ferretti. Yes. Uh... Uh, dispute is um, is an interesting area, and um, I'd like to start by saying that uh, there is disputes uh, everywhere, uh, in families, uh, even at workplace, uh, and it's even more complex uh, when it comes to to you know disputes around uh, uh, you know around uh, land uh, land ownership and land uses. Eh? And uh, uh, there are two, you know, two ways. There are more than two ways that uh, Fiji, in Fiji, uh, they are used. Disputes are also resolved in a traditional way. Uh, you know, the both uh, the the clan that uh, is in the wrong and the clan. Uh, they can come together or seek uh, forgiveness from each other. We call mbulumbulu uh, to resolve their issues. And and uh, in an informal setting, Alano around the, the cover uh, can also resolve a lot of uh, issues. Yeah? Uh, nowadays, when it comes to uh, disputes, uh, most of those are taken directly to court, which is unfortunate. Uh, but it's uh, I think I guess it's the nature of uh, how things are uh, right now. Um, it involves uh, uh, money. It involves uh, um, uh, corporate partnerships. That involves uh, legal uh, transactions. Uh, that's where uh, the court system uh, and and uh, they, we don't have a, a traditional court system like Vanuatu, so it's just a, the national uh, court uh, uh, system eh? uh, that is uh, that is used for uh, for those. Uh, but it's an it's a I guess it's in in an area or the space. Uh, and I'm sure it will continue to evolve um, to be able to find, uh, you know, solutions. I am, uh, we're here in Palau uh, looking at um, looking at establishing what we call a community justice system for uh, fisheries, uh, where you know where uh, uh, what do you call this? Um, <laughs> Where, um, where they can, where they can bring the offenders to, uh, you know, to a a committee, uh, if not the chiefs, the, the talatala, 
or the um, uh, to preside over the the offenses eh? uh, or uh, looking uh, presiding over the offense but the idea of recreating uh, perhaps a, a traditional court system uh, a menu one or just a, a forum where they can where they can uh, look at the uh, uh, sanctions uh, in relation to fisheries uh, crimes eh? um, thank you Thank you so much both um, and for taking the time to answer all the questions. Um, we have a few more. So we were wondering if you would be okay to respond to two more questions. Only if you feel like you have the time and energy <laughs> in the evening. Yeah, okay. We... Okay, fantastic. Um, so we have a question from Anna. Um, so looking at how um, the unfinished business of decolonization um, has been a common thread um, in specifically the two first presentations, um, as we know, uh, it's a long standing issue. And so a question is, um, what can realistically be addressed in this ocean science decade um, for indigenous governance systems to be given equal space and recognition in international ocean governance systems? Okay, I'll, I'll give a, a first go at the, the question from Anna. <clears throat> yes, uh, as Anna's mentioned, it's uh, it's uh, stemmed from uh, as well. Yes, one can say it stems from the legacy from colonial colonial times and uh, the, the 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 big uh, the big issue we have today of trying to decolonize all this uh, these systems that have been placed upon us uh, to try and find that uh, that unique balance that we we as specific islanders as as, uh, as specific island countries want to want to want to achieve so um, what could be achieved in this ocean science decade for indigenous governance um, well, I think looking looking back over the past years, how many from my experience, ten years or so working in this space, a lot's been achieved. A lot has changed, um, and uh, uh, we have a lot more information, scientific data uh, that can be used. But also, there's also um, a, a great revival, I think, of uh, of the area of uh, traditional uh, revival, customary reforms. Um, so I think we, from my perspective, we might be at a, uh, within this decade, I, I think we could, we could uh, uh, find this, this niche or this sweet spot where uh, we can, we can uh, align the two or complement the two systems, allow them to complement each other. I'm, I'm aware that um, oh, myself and Lisa, we used to work for IUCN and undertaking uh, marine spatial plans for most of the, a lot of the Pacific Island countries. Uh, and uh, to, to come up with this, this is just an example for the marine spatial planning. We come up with marine spatial plans for uh, the Pacific Island countries that are pushing forward for this. So I think it's uh, Vanuatu, Fiji, Solomons, Kiribati, I think Samoa is also coming in. Uh, but a key issue is to get the, the plan in place, but also have the legislation, the legislation uh, uh, to back this plan up and that you can detect it and uh, be used to enforce it. So I think this, it's different, different for each country. But I think one way of uh, one thing I one thing I can think of that we could we should try and strive for in this decade of ocean uh, uh, science is trying to uh, try to push forward this uh, these plans and uh, as our countries all we all we all call ourselves now uh, large ocean states 
And uh, the key to, to, to being large ocean states, one, one part of it is getting these plans developed and also the legal backing behind it to be able to, to enforce the plans. And once uh, you, we, we can enforce these plans and uh, manage our resources, then we can be, then we can, uh, then we can safeguard and, and play in the, in, the, in the global arena as large ocean states. I think from my perspective, one thing that should be achieved or we should try to do in this decade is uh, going ahead with these MSPs, these marine special plans, and trying to get them achieved by, uh, by the end of this decade, I think. Yeah, that's one perspective from my, um, my point of view. Thanks. Thank you so much, Batu. Um, I don't know, Ali Ferretti, if you want to respond to that as well. Yes, it's a it's a very very good question. Um, I yeah, I think um, if if we look across the Pacific, uh, whether it's our ocean state, whether it's our ocean or land, you know the you know the seventy or eighty percent of those spaces, um, I'm, I'm talking about the land, in this case, they are uh, owned by uh, communities. And uh, in the case of Fiji, all the customary fishing grounds or the Ngolingolis, um, you know, have uh, cust uh, communities have custodian right over that. And I think if it's anywhere in the world, it would have to be the Pacific to bring out the importance of indigenous governance, because it's, uh, uh, and I, you know, I, I, I mentioned about customary law and where common law starts, you know, customary law is, is the default where, you know, you start with it. You start with it and where it, it ends, and then perhaps that's where cust, uh, common law can start, uh, can add on. Uh, but in the absence of uh, common law, the, the customary law is what makes sense in our context, in our, in our customary tenure system, in our customary fishing ground, in our land tenure uh, system. And if uh, you know, if in anything in this decade of um, ocean, uh, I think uh, the Pacific had to be very, uh, very intentional in bringing out the importance of indigenous uh, governance uh, in the in the global space as, as well as in the the regional platforms. Um, thank you for 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 yeah, the opportunity to say this piece. I, I feel very strongly uh, about those uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ali Ferretti. And I think that's such a great point <laughs> that can't be, um, yeah, can't be expressed enough. Um, so we have one final question. Um, and I do realize that we haven't been able to post all questions. So we will send them out to our speakers after the event and see if we can get a written response. Um, so the final question is, what have been your experiences on when dialogue and participatory rulemaking has worked best and when it might not have worked uh, well? Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yes, for, this, for our experiences and what has worked best for us uh, with regards to um, uh, uh, participatory uh, informed consent, uh, that's, that's very important. Be, to be done with communities. Um, uh, 
because communities are the ones that live each day, day by day with the resources, they know it inside and out. And they, they are the custodians of these resources. So um, you have to, in, in context for Vanuatu, and I think for other cases of other Pacific Islands, you have to work with the, uh, the communities and the traditional resource managers and the traditional resource systems that are in place um, in, in order for you to have, a, to have any effective outcome that you, that you want to do or any initiative you want to carry out. Um, what I find is that uh, uh, some communities, communities differ from, from island to island, uh, area to area. Uh, some communities, it seems, uh, the larger the community, the more complex the, uh, the systems or the, the more issues step about from it. And when you work with some communities that are more smaller in population size, remote, that still uh, practice and engage in these traditional systems, and it's uh, still being upheld, then you find that the, uh, the uptake or your, um, your uh, uh, they, they work, it, they're, better, they're better to work with as long as you uh, work alongside these traditional systems that they have in place. And uh, once the ownership, the ownership is key. Once their communities understand what you, what you're trying to achieve, what the initiative wants to do, and they take up that ownership and they feel that it's theirs, then you get the most, the greatest response, the best outcomes are being achieved. But uh, where these systems are being degraded, there might be because of large uh, size. Uh, or many other issues or uh, degraded because they, they're starting to adopt more Western lifestyle and foregoing the traditional, uh, the traditional uh, ways of uh, living as, uh, as is the case in these modern times, then you'll, you'll find, uh, find issues, uh, issues arising. But uh, uh, as long as you understand uh, the context of the communities that you're working with and the structures that are in place and try, your, try as best as you can to align with that and get the ownership amongst them, then I find that uh, uh, that's, where you, that's where you get the most traction and uh, uh, the best outcomes from what, you, what you're trying to, trying to do with these communities. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Vatu. Um, Ali Ferretti, do you want to respond as well? Sorry, I, I missed the, the, the question. Would you be able to? Of course, yes. Yeah. So um, what have been your experiences on when dialogue and participatory uh -huh. rulemaking has worked best um, and when it might not have worked as well? Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, we in my in our experience uh, with uh, the LMMA and the communities uh, um, developing rules, uh, developing rules from the start is where you need the you know participatory uh, rule making. Yeah? Uh, but um, where um, where you, where there is a, a clearly a solution in place, or or there's a government uh, regulation, and that's where you uh, you just need a more you just need a government's decision, uh, sorry, a chief's decision. Um, the chief's decision is saying, okay, we are accepting the ban, which is, you don't need any other uh, uh, participation in the, in, in the rule. But where you, you require participation is how they are going to, um, how are they going to enforce, how are they going to implement that 
that that rule. Uh, I'm I'm using uh, you know an example um, like a ban a, a ban a national ban that uh, the community wants to internalize. So the ban has already been done. Uh, so the rule by uh, the chief's decision is just we'll just have to take it. Uh, but for them, um, they'll they'll go through the participatory process in looking at how and why they implement uh, how how they implement those uh, decisions. Eh? Whereas uh, uh, where you want uh, participation and compliance from the communities themselves um, on those uh, key rules, uh, especially customary law. Uh, that's where you need uh, participatory rulemaking uh, for bans that are, you know, that come from government. It clearly has enforcement system that will take its uh, course. But uh, you know, for customary uh, rules or community rules that are based uh, on customary practices and rules, it requires uh, customary. Uh, sorry, uh, participatory uh, rulemaking. I hope I'm uh, making sense uh, there. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you so much um, to all the people who post questions in the chat and live. And thank you so much to our speakers for amazing responses. Um, I'm handing it over to David to do the closing. Excellent, thank you, Mia. Before I start kind of closing up, I just wanted to flag that in the chat, um, Alana has posted that there is a local virtual event next Monday um, on mobilising ocean science in large ocean island states, opportunities and challenges. And your contact is in there in case you want to learn more and to register for that. But for now, please join us all in thanking our three fantastic speakers, Lisa Winnie, Fatima Lisa, and Alifereti Tawaki for sharing their rich insights and knowledge. It's been a really insightful morning or evening, depending where you are. Um, thank you also to Bola Erinosho and Mia Strand for helping to facilitate this session. And thank you all for joining us and proposing such excellent questions too. Just a note, I know there's been some um, quite asked requests in the chat about the recording. The recording of this event will be shared soon. So if you would like to listen again to these insightful presentations, you'll be able to do so. I'll make sure to email you all with that recording. On another note, we are planning to host at least two more of these sessions focused on customary laws and intangible heritage and ocean governance. So if you have any suggestions for speakers or you might want to present your own experiences and insights, then please get in touch with me too. In the meantime, thank you again, everyone, and I wishing you all either a good day ahead or a restful sleep. Thank you for joining us, especially those who joined us so late. And thank you to our speakers. Take care. Bye.